Can a socialist choose Hillary Clinton over Bernie Sanders? Find out today on The Laura Flanders Show when I talk with playwright and screenwriter Tony Kushner. And later in the show, I visit with an art gallery by, with, and for Roma people in Hungary. It embraces hip-hop and bell hooks. All that and a few words from me on moving forwards, not backwards, in Europe. Welcome to our program. Our next guest has been awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Drama, an Emmy Award, two Tony Awards, two Academy Award nominations, and President Obama presented him with the National Medal of Arts in 2013. This fall, he was entered into the National Theater Hall of Fame. And no wonder. Among his plays are Angels in America, A Gay Fantasia on National Themes, Caroline or Change, and The Intelligent Homosexual's Guide to Capitalism and Socialism with a Key to the Scriptures. He's written films, among them Steven Spielberg's Lincoln, and Munich. He's also written or edited several books, including Wrestling with Zion, Progressive Jewish American Responses to the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict, co-edited with Elisa Solomon. Tony, welcome to the program. Thanks. So nice to be here. Let me ask you about Angels in America. I, I, I went back uh, and saw it not so long ago in, in Hungary. Uh, I'll tell you more about that later, but it caused me to go back to the text and, and read it again. And I was reminded how incredibly um, current its relevance is. Written in 1992, um, it speaks to a sense of change that people are feeling differently today, I think, and yet it's still as, as poignant as it ever was. I'm, I'm talking about that sense that a lot of people have today, that the world is broken, that um, states are broken, ideologies are broken, there's chaos everywhere. In 1992, it's almost as if you were suggesting this was going to be a great opportunity for creative, new life and, and, and theory creation. Um, how are you feeling about it now? Um, I, when I listen to the play now, we just did a revival of it in New York, well, just, we did it in 2010, right. that was five years ago, it seems like yesterday. Uh, when I hear the play done now, it feels um, optimistic uh, to an extent. Um, and, and the parts of it that seem most immediately uh, relevant are some of the darker things. The, uh, the stuff that's in the play about climate yeah. catastrophe uh, is is very relevant now. When I first wrote the play, I thought, this is a little sketchy. Am I really right about any of this? Yeah. Or are we going to just discover that this is all nonsense? That was in the late 80s, early 90s. And now, of course, you know, there's no question whatsoever that we're in horrible, horrible, I mean, trouble unlike any right. the human race or the planet has ever faced. And uh, that feels very... Um, current and very grim. But I, you know, I still feel optimistic. Mm -hmm. I, I think that um, there are many, you know, terrible things. It's hard work. We're in one of those periods where reading the newspaper any given day is very, very hard work uh, because there's so much to despair about and so much that's frightening. Um, but I think that we're in the in, in a period of, of um, uh, a great sort of grappling yeah. with, uh, with questions of definition. And I prefer the moments of, of real struggle with it, as I think that, for instance, in this country and, and all over the world, people are, are doing now grappling with questions of national identity mm -hmm. um, and, and political identity, sexual identity, yep. gender identity, and so on. It's, uh, uh, these times are, are f always fraught with, with great pain and, and great striving and great suffering um, simultaneously. But I'd rather be um, in the middle of one of those mm -hmm. times of tumult than in a time of complacency, because, of course, complacency only means that oppression is working and that people are being silenced uh, through uh, tremendous uh, violence. Uh, and being kept invisible. Um, at a time like this, when there's been a certain amount of decentering, mm -hmm. you know, it's scary, but it's, it, it is a, a, a moment when I think we can feel and see change uh, beginning to happen. But I guess that's kind of the question. Do we end up with tribalism or solidarity? You've always been a believer in, in, in solidarity. To be yeah, clear. and I, you know, and I think that there's uh, Great evidence um, uh, in in many quarters of of uh, the effectiveness of uh, communities of oppressed people 
uh, making common Isaac, cause give me an of example. Cheer me up. Well, I mean, I think that, that for instance, the the um, recent successes of the LGBT mm-hmm. uh, Q, et cetera, movement um, uh, in in terms of uh, civil law, um, uh, in terms of same sex marriage, um, I think that it's uh, there was a great coming together of, of a number of communities, including you know sort of sexual majoritarian communities, mm-hmm. uh, um, to. Uh, Effect a, a transformation through the machinery of electoral uh, government, and I think it's been a significant and really um, uh, enormously uh, powerful and profound uh, change. But, I, you, but you were one of the people who, in the '90s, I remember your amazing essay for the Nation magazine, "Solid Socialism of the Skin," calling for me beyond assimilation, uh, for for real liberation. Right. Um, you got married a few years ago. Right. I, I don't hold that against you. But what <laughs> happened to this broader vision of of real radicalism? Well, I think we're seeing it happening. I mean, uh, I think that 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 the the aims of of the. Uh, I mean, I, I think that there's no discounting, and I don't think that I did in the essay that I wrote in the early '90s. You, uh, I mean, Angels in America ends with sure. Prior Walter saying, we'll be citizens. I think enfranchisement in yeah. a democratic society, and this is a dem- functioning democratic society for all of its flaws, is an immensely important thing. Um, I believe in uh, electoral politics. I, I would prefer to ha- see change come about peacefully mm-hmm. uh, than through violence and bloodshed. Yeah. And I, uh, um, but I think that, that as soon as, I mean, the, the right is only right about one thing which is that none of the agendas that they're always warning themselves about, you know, the gay agenda, uh, is limited to just a, a small mm-hmm. sort of, you know, can we please get married, can we please adopt children? That's not small, but that's not the, that's the beginning of something, not the end yeah. of something. And that, that, that any successful movement for civil rights or enfranchisement then opens the door to a, to a, a, a questioning of, uh, of assumptions that were simply not, um, uh, it wasn't even possible to yeah. question before. So, uh, you know, we see people now, um, the, the trans movement, the movement of sort of uh, gender questioning, um, uh, uh, new, infinitely more subtle and complicated uh, dialogue going on about race, um, about ethnicity, um, uh, internationalism, uh, and, and, you know, although I think we're lagging behind in this department, economics, mm-hmm. I think that there are a lot of questions that mm-hmm. are now being asked that, that, that will push us more and more uh, uh, to a, an economically um, as well as a socially just mm-hmm. world. I sound very sort of Mary Sunshine right now. <laughs> well, I, talk about sunshine. I'm reminded that you and I were both on that um, February 15th, 2003, March to Stop the War in Iraq, you know, it's decade, well, it a decade and a half ago, um, we spectacularly failed to stop the war. Um, a lot of expectations, hopes perhaps were dashed, but, but relationships were built. I mean, where do you come down on how change happens? Well, I mean, that that March, I, I was, uh, I've never spoken to a crowd that size. Enormous. Before, and I don't, um, it largest was enormous. Globally and coordinated march at that time. Ever. Yes, I think it was lo- at that point the largest in his- in history, and and uh, and it was a terrifyingly cold day, and so the passion of those uh, that million plus people who who turned out on the East River, to to you know in a desperate last minute move to say we we mustn't go ahead and invade Iraq. We mustn't start bombing in Baghdad. I mean, it was enormously moving, and then the next day uh, W made his infamous remark when they said, what do you think? And he said, well, they're like a focus group for television. And I thought, well, actually, that's kind of the only true thing I've ever heard that creep (laughs) say. Because, you know, and it was a big changing point for me. I I felt like, well, yes, we've actually surrendered control of the uh, machinery of power to Mm -hmm. such an enormous degree that all we can do is sort of make uh, our preference for not attacking, not destabilizing, uh, destabilizing the region, uh, known. Beyond that, there was no one really to listen to us. There right. were senators who voted against the war, but most senators, including some very good people, yeah. uh, including the person that I hope will be the next president of the United States, voted for the war because uh, we had 
given up too much um, uh, in terms of actual political power. Mm. And, and that was a huge turning mm. point for me. Mm. I, I began to really ask uh, questions that I'm still <laughs> grappling with about, you know, dreams of revolution right. and what uh, the dream of revolution has done to the progressive community and, uh, and whether or not change is um, uh, more uh, likely to be anticipated from um, a sort of uh, uh, movements that lie outside of the political or if, if the sort of um, uh, if if in mainstream yeah. politics revolutionary change uh, can come about, and I and I really believe that it can, and I think that getting control of the machinery of power of this country uh, uh, is um, a matter of absolute sort of planetary life and death at this point. All right, so uh, I, I'm assuming you're not suddenly becoming a Republican. It sounds like no, I'm you're voting about for Hillary control Clinton away from them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as opposed to Bernie Sanders, but isn't Bernie Sanders the self-described socialist, and aren't you? Haven't you described yourself as a socialist? What has uh, Hillary well, done to win you over? Um, uh, you know, uh, sort of what she said in the first debate, that she's a progressive person who gets things done. Uh -huh. I mean, I admire Bernie Sanders very, very much. Uh -huh. I've never called myself a democratic socialist just because I, you know, it's a very specific political movement that I don't necessarily uh, want to you know, ally myself uh, with. But I, um, I believe, I call myself a socialist because I believe that there is such a category as economic justice. I don't think that justice is purely a matter of um, equality before the law. I think that the way that, uh, that, that, that uh, the financial sector, uh, that, that the economy part of a political economy operates has everything to do with whether or not there'll right. actually be justice in the world. Um, and I believe that it's, uh, money is not morally neutral. I think it's a, it's a human uh, system of meaning and, and uh, it can be manipulated for good or for mm. evil, mm. and we have abandoned far too much of the control over it to people whose main intention is evil to the extent that it's mm. absolutely, unquestionably, um, uh, perversely self-serving for a very, very, very tiny group of people who then convince everybody else that it's in their interests to enrich this tiny group of people. And I... So that's so, your view on socialism, but then yeah, how does Hillary Clinton get to be your candidate? Because I think that, you know, uh, and working on the Lincoln screenplay changed me enormously in this regard. Mm -hmm. I, I, I believe that um, in an electoral democracy, uh, compromise is necessary. Yeah. And I believe in an electoral democracy like ours, where there are two political parties, um, well, at this point, you can almost, it's almost difficult to say that, because mm -hmm. there's, there's one political party, and then there's this incoherent, shrieking, <laughs> chaotic nightmare that, right. that the Reagan counter-revolution has spawned on the other side. And it's really bad news mm -hmm. for American democracy that, that the two-party system is gone now, and what you have is a, is a, uh, a party that still apparently uh, has as its front runner for presidential uh, uh, candidate uh, a man like Donald Trump, yeah. um, who is, you know, insane. Uh, um, I think that that's a very bad state of affairs. But, uh, you know, I do believe that um, some of the most uh, enduring, um, important transformations of human society that I've seen in my lifetime and that I'm aware of as a student of history have come about through electoral yeah. uh, politics. I, and but, so, I mean, that was one of the criticisms of, of Lincoln was that it, it, I mean, it did a brilliant portrayal of how those compromises got written, got made, um, and a study of legislation I, I know of no better on film. But it, how, the, how compromises got made, and also how the compromises led to yeah. a very significant, huge step uh, forward. Well, the Thirteenth Amendment. We are stepped out upon the world stage now, with the fate of human dignity in our hands. Blood's been spilled to afford us this moment now, now, now. But there have been a huge move, I and mean, there were movements in the background. Oh, of course, There's Frederick absolutely. Douglass. Well, is there a movie that tells that story? Well, you know, our, my assignment was to write a movie, the first studio film about Abraham Lincoln in 72 years. Yeah. Uh, the federal government at the time was an entirely white male government. Uh, I mean, entirely. And uh, I didn't want to falsify history. Right. Um, I, Frederick Douglass is, a, is one of the greatest human beings that ever lived and made a tremendous uh, difference in the world. And I'm not, I wasn't making a claim, Spielberg wasn't making a claim. 
about you know which one was the greater person, Abraham Lincoln or Frederick Douglass. <laughs> we were making a claim that Abraham Lincoln was a very great yeah. person. Are you a fan of Black Lives Matter? Uh, sure. I mean, absolutely. Fan is, a, is an, odd, uh, an odd. What do you word, think of it? I think you know. It's, uh, as I said a little bit earlier, I think that we're in um, uh, a period now of uh, a new kind of discussion uh, about um, race in this country. I, you know, I don't believe that uh, one can say that there has been no progress. Um, I think there's been immense progress. Um, uh, I think it's it's palpable. It's it's concrete. But uh, racism is an em enormously pernicious and powerful yeah. force, and it operates, you know, in uh, ugly, sort of uh, grotesque, obvious ways, garish ways, and it also uh, operates in in uh, Mm, subtler mm. Mm. Uh, ways and through subtler systems. And I think that we're seeing um, in Black Lives Matter and the fights that are being held on college campuses now uh, um, a real discussion that wasn't possible before about how to begin to envision a society that really uh, responds with sensitivity to uh, um, subjective experiences that are uh, um, you know, wildly various mm. and different from one another. And, and uh, again, there's, that struggle is going to be, it's a groping and it's a, it's a, we're always a little blind mm. when we start uh, trying to make something new. But it seems to me something new is taking place. Two last things. I just can't let you go without talking a little bit about what's happening in Israel-Palestine. You, 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 you're a big critic of Israel, but you're still call yourself a Zionist? I'm, I'm curious. No, I don't. But you don't anymore? I've never. Oh, OK. I'm, my, my mistake. I, I'm not an anti-Zionist. OK. Uh, I'm, I'm a diasporan Jew, and I'm a citizen of the United States. I'm not a citizen of Israel. Um, I, I absolutely, you know, the, the. Are you a supporter of the BDS movement? No. What do you make of I'm that? I'm not. I, 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 you know, um, I like a lot of the people involved yeah, sure. in the BDS movement, in this country especially. In Europe, it's, uh, it has some strange affiliations. I don't think that Israel is South Africa. I don't think that the model um, uh, that brought about the end of apartheid in South Africa can be applied to Israel. And I think that a boycott of Israel is um, not going to lead to... Um, uh, anything other than um, uh, uh, a more unreachable um, and hardened uh, country um, more completely in the grips of, of mm. its uh, political right. Um, I, I believe that, uh, you know, any approach to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict has to be, uh, you have to approach it with a full awareness of Jewish history and uh, um, the way in which the founding of the State of Israel um, is a, a direct consequence of, of, you know, a long and, and terribly difficult struggle against oppression mm -hmm. and uh, to assign Israel the role of some sort of colonial power um, dominating the region uh, is, I think, to mis profoundly misunderstand from at least the Jewish point of view. Uh, um, I mean, I'll, you it know, certainly underestimates I'm not the asking, evil of the British Empire. If you ask, well, me. yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's like we 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 weren't, you know, Palestine, the the British Mandate. You can say anything you, you want up about, this way. but you know, uh, it's that, that's not in any way to exculpate, yeah. um, you know, the the really horrendous treatment of the Palestinian people uh, um, by uh, Israel. Um, but it matters enormously to me that uh, it seems to me that, that the um, uh, occupation and and the violation of human rights and the and you know kill ratios of thirteen hundred to one uh, um, is is a uh, an absolute uh, violation of Jewish ethical mm -hmm. teaching. And if if you know I have issues about any state calling itself a Jewish state or a Christian state or you know no matter what the history and I I don't know how Israel will ultimately resolve that. I believe in the two state solution. I call myself a diasporan Jew. Um, I have friends who are anti-Zionists. I have friends who are Zionists, and friends who don't have an opinion at all. And I Keep think on wrestling. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. Great to be with you. Wonderful. Thanks to see for coming you in. Again, honestly, thanks. you can find out more about all of Tony Krishna's work at our website.
You can hear more interviews like that on our audio podcast available at lauraflanders.com. Last year, I had a chance to travel to Hungary, courtesy of the Independent Theatre Critics Association and their colleagues. There, I visited Gallery 8. It's the first Roma art gallery in Hungary. And I spoke with the co-founder and one of the artists. Here's some of that conversation. I am a Tima Jung host uh, and I am um, uh, a Roma woman. Uh, I'm also an art historian and uh, I was born here in Budapest in the A district, which is the district which has the largest Roma population. A district has its own identity. It is the district where most of the Roma people live, uh, where 90% of the students at schools are actually Roma children. The majority of Roma in Hungary are living in very difficult financial circumstances. Here in the city, you know, there are also well-to-do Roma families, those whom are, com whom are living in historical musicians' families uh, uh, and have a very strong family history of being an artist or intellectual. Gallery 8 is a Roma contemporary art space. It started in 2013 February after the A District municipality and basically Budapest closed down all the cultural places and spaces available for self-representation of the Roma people. We put a lot of energy into demonstrating the government's decisions and also trying to save the existing places, uh, collections and initiatives. But in 2013, our team decided that it is time that we do not oppose the government's actions anymore. It is time that we do not put our ideas into the future, that we start performing them in the here and now. Hát ez egy kommunikációs felület, és mindez a reflektálás, mindez a múltból való megtörtént eseményekre kell reflektálni. This is Tibor Balog, a contemporary artist. He grew up in a, uh, in a state orphanage. Tibor was the first, he graduated in 2005, and at the moment uh, he knows about five artists whom are studying or who have graduated from the Fine Arts Academy. Ciális üzenete van, egyrészt koncentrálódik abból a szempontból, hogy itt jócskán romák élnek, cigányok élnek, és az a sztereotíp jelenség, ahol megtalálhat, itt Magyarországon vagy Budapesten a fővárosban, ez, ez főleg ide fókuszálódik, és másképp fog ennek az üzenete lejönni Budán, egy gazdag negyedben, mint itt a nyolcadik kerületben. It's extremely important to show different images of Roma, those who are educated, those who can provide a role model for the future generations, uh, artists, which is a very untraditional role in the Roma community. So we, you know, being present in the Roma community in these different roles and providing this image also for the majority society is, uh, is really unusual. Uh, and and uh, perhaps sends a completely different message than what we have communicated before. African American analogies are extremely important inspiration for the Roma intellectual movement. Um, and I think what we have to say is even the most difficult circumstances, you know, the we need to build on our culture because basically in the Roma context, culture is the only area where, where we can talk about the Roma, not as a problem, as our friend Du Bois uh, has referred to it, not as a problem, but Roma and Roma culture as an asset. 
and we also gain a lot of inspiration from African-American feminist theorists uh, uh, and uh, this gallery is actually the proof that opposition is not enough, uh, not even in the Roma context. As Bell Hooks, uh, uh, African-American theorist said opposition is not enough, uh, in the vacant moment uh, after one has resisted there is the need to make ourselves anew. So this is the space, uh, Gallery 8, where we make ourselves anew. Halfway through Tony Kushner's play, Angels in America, two old Bolsheviks consider the prospect of the future in a scene set in the Kremlin on the verge of the end of the Soviet Union in 1985. The great question before us is, are we doomed, says one? Will the past release us? Thirty years on, as Europeans reel from financial shock, austerity, and the biggest inward migration in memory, it's a question that's still without an answer. What is clear is that the authoritarianism of the past has yet to release its grip. In 2015, right-wing nationalist parties won elections across the continent, from Austria to Poland, Sweden, Turkey, and Denmark. Leading the way, of course, was Hungary, where strongman Viktor Orban has been in office as prime minister since 2010. Orban has a massive majority, just short of two-thirds. His only real competition comes from the neo-fascist Jobbik movement. To keep ahead of that, he's used his power to write a new constitution, pack the courts, purge the arts, and rain terror on the very poor and anyone he considers an outsider. Before the war's refugees, it was Jews, gypsies, and LGBT people. Forward or back? The last time I saw Angels in America was in Budapest in 2013. There, that Kremlin scene played out in what felt like a very contemporary context. Playing Prior Walter, Kushner's outspoken, cross-dressing, openly gay lead was Robert Alfady, an outspoken, gay, cosmopolitan Jew who had just been ousted from his job as director of Hungary's National Theatre to be replaced by an Orban appointee who had sworn to return the place to its Hungarian roots and make the national a sacred space. Cut to the end of the play. The world only spins forward, said Alfredi, as Walter, speaking unmistakably for all outsiders. We will be citizens. The time has come. For every night of the run, the normally reserved Hungarian audience rose, clapping in unison, to give the play, Alfredi, and the future a rousing ovation. It is a long piece, which ends with the words, the great work begins. Krishna's right. The great work of forward over backward isn't easy, nor is it over. Not yet. Just tell me what you think. Write to Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com. And thanks. What would our world look like today if our media showed us as much collaboration as they do competition? What if we got to meet people making change right here, right now, in all sorts of ways we're usually told are impossible? Subscribe today to The Laura Flanders Show for in-depth interviews with forward-thinking people. Smarts, not sound bites, every week, right here. Subscribe, and thanks. This week on the Laura Flanders Show, feminist Zila Eisenstein will be on the program. Radical feminism, historically, really was an enormously inclusive concept about the female body, whatever, however it was expressed. We'll also visit with the Damayan Cleaning Cooperative. If you have a call, well, you know, you're the boss. <laughs> This week on The Laura Flanders Show, what does it mean to put yourself on the line for your beliefs? Actress Kathleen Chalfont, who's known for her brave performances and her principled political stances. Art is not an amenity for the privileged. It is the deepest expression of the human soul. And we look at Stanley Cohen, a lawyer who's gone to jail. And there are some of us who challenge the system every way, every day.